the way that you described how every, how and when you kill an animal how much impact is created the ripple effect yes is manifested in how indigenous people would be mindful to not even speak ill of the animal right they're they're very mindful how how they speak about these animals because they understood the subtle energies of speaking disparagingly about this animal and i think that the myth that hunting reveals is the felt embodied experience of interconnectedness of all beings and all things. You know, we have a bit of a problem in the world today. I wouldn't say a bit, I'd say a very big problem. And that is that the scientific materialist influences have really converted the concept that the public has of a myth into something that's equal to a lie or a fake story or something made up and not not made up in the sense that a myth can't be made up, but a myth can be made up. It's not made up. It's actually channeled in. But people's when we use the word myth today, most people think it's silliness or airy fairy or outdated old stuff. You know. So I, I'd be interested to hear what do you feel myth is, and what is myth's function, and how is that important today? Great question and great distinction. The materialist worldview, which has its own value and benefit, is is only one way of seeing and in in some ways thinking about the world. Myths occur to me as a way of feeling about the world. And the myth is oftentimes less about what is being said verbatim as we try and conceptualize what is truth and more about what are the deeper messages that are being laid down for for humanity in a wisdom sense in a medicinal sense that can last you know the ages and it's no surprise that as the rise in the materialist worldview has increased the connection to organized religion has decreased because christianity as an example the bible is myth it's filled with myth and allegory and when you or when one studies you know the, the story of genesis or any of the 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 myths within the bible we can distill certain wisdom. And of course, that's wisdom that is a product of a post-agricultural world. So it's a little bit different in terms of the wisdom that might show up with hunter-gatherers in a lot of the indigenous tribes. But nonetheless, the myth have these wisdom components to it that are underlying and, and underpinning it. And as far as as far as how it occurs, I think what I said earlier really is something to look at for everybody. How does a myth feel? And it's feel it's somewhat ambiguous, but everyone knows the feeling of reading a quote and just having it like hit them in their body to the degree that they want to, you know, get a tattoo or repost it or whatever the case is. And, that is a small morsel of the felt wisdom that comes through in myths. Yeah, I think another thing about myth that people don't realize is that one of the functions of myth is that it opens a gateway to the transcendent. 
realms. So it takes you, it can open you to mystical experiences, but it can also, like you talked about ancestors and the primal experience that we can feel inside of us. Those are transcendent experiences where you realize that you're not only participating in an act that's been done through through the entire lineage of humanity, you're not only participating in something sacred in, in taking another life, which impacts the flock, the pack, the, the family of the animal itself, just no different than if we were being hunted and your mother, fra- father, brother, or sister got killed, it would have a very profound impact. And I think part of the problem that, that, that hunters have today that don't have this understanding of myth and connection like that is also borne out in the scientific materialist viewpoint of science because those people don't believe that animals have feelings, thoughts, emotions, a mind of their own, relationships. They actually don't think they're conscious. They really think along the line of them being more like a biological robot and who cares if you dissect it into pieces. And so they don't really have any kind of a soul connection to life forms outside of humanity and everything to them is really some kind of a machine. So you have this sort of broken mentality that makes great toasters and cell phones and cars, but doesn't realize that it's doing it while it's destroying life on earth. Um, so there's so a, there- there's a great quote that literally I took this book that's next to me and I turned right to the page. Perfect. And it says, unlike scientists who only observe animals externally and measure their external reactions, they, the shamans, the people who are connected to the hunt, experience the animals so to say from the inside yeah and that's that's in a sense it's a transcendence of one's self-awareness to the inclusion of more life more consciousness more reality you know reality gets deeper when you transcend yourself instead of just living in your own show your own ego's drama, you now mature into realizing that you're part of a very delicate weave that requires consciousness to balance the the taking and the regenerative process, or we actually, you know, to use the symbol of the Ouroboros, if the Ouroboros eats more than it can regenerate, it dies. You know, for those of you that aren't familiar with the word Ouroboros, it's the snake or the dragon that eats its own tail, which is a metaphor for God and a metaphor for life. And so here we all are on a planet where most people have never seen how an animal's killed. They've never seen the fear in its eyes. They've never seen the reaction of other animals when one of their own gets killed. Um, so that they really just think food just shows up magically in a store, which is why I tell a lot of my students that one way to manage your meat eating and keep it from being hubristic or uh, disrespectful is to attend the slaughter of an animal and be fully present while the animal's being gutted and, and butchered so that you can really watch something go from being alive to being transformed into food, but have a visceral sense of the fact that you have legitimately taken a life and you have altered the course of the world forever in that act. Uh, You know, we, we tend to see ourselves as disconnected from the world. The world's become a material thing. And so cutting down trees and, building pay parking lots and shopping malls we don't need and just wiping out the insect population, anything that irritates you, you just kill it with sprays or whatever. You know, that, that, 
that kind of mentality is is an example of removing the sacred from the hunt and it just becomes a death machine at that point but that that that's the ouroboros over consuming itself and that leads to a, a crisis and and personally i i one of the things i've loved about the whole covid pandemic is as much as i don't like the tyranny of it one of the things that covid has done is it's a made people more aware of the importance of relationships because the segregation really was an abstinence from connection and that abstinence from connection made people realize how important connection is to the food shortages are making people think about food and i think that's really important and three it made people realize that life isn't controllable or predictable and even when you think your government loves you and your medical systems there to protect you dot 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 you come to realize that life is something that's sacred but you often don't realize what you've got until it's gone so i think sort of the the flip side of the pandemic coin is that it's brought people into a much deeper state of awareness even if it's just thinking about their own values more carefully and because so many people have been injured and killed by it it's also um it's also as though the hunt has been reversed and now in many ways we're being hunted by our own and that also can really bring you into a state of a higher level of consciousness one of the people that i've had the great pleasure of interviewing in fact i did the last interview with him before he died was one of the world's leading experts on myth james cars and james cars gives a beautiful definition of myth he says myth is a story that tells itself myth is a story that tells itself so when we're looking at myths around sacred hunting what do you think the story that's telling itself is the way that you described how every, how and when you kill an animal how much impact is created the ripple effect yes is manifested in how indigenous people would be mindful to not even speak ill of the animal right they're they're very mindful how how they speak about these animals because they understood the subtle energies of speaking disparagingly about this animal and i think that the myth that hunting reveals is the felt embodied experience of interconnectedness of all beings and all things yes i think that's very beautiful well stated and very very true if there's a short myth that is something that lines up with the sacred hunt is there one you could share yes i love one that my spiritual teacher told me and it's as with many indigenous myths it has to do with a grandfather and a grandson and a a boy 13 years old he he's told by his parents that he needs to go to his grandfather in order to learn how to hunt so he goes to his grandfather who's sitting on the porch and he tells him grandfather i've been told i need to hunt and you're to be my guide the grandfather says okay well the first thing that you need to do is when you go home at night i want you to imagine a deer just using your imagination before you go to sleep see the deer and come back so the boy goes and he tries that for a few days and comes back to his grandfather and he says well i'm having a hard time doing it grandpa i can't i can't see the deer grandpa says 
you need to just in your mind's eye imagine the animal just using your creativity and the boy goes back a couple days finally comes back okay grandpa I saw the deer with my imagination. And grandfather says, good, good. Now I want you to go back and imagine that you were there with the deer. So the boy goes and takes a couple days and imagines that he's with the deer in, in his mind's eye. Comes back and tells his grandfather. His grandfather says, good, good. Now I, I want you to go into the woods you'll actually go into nature now and i want you to find the place where you imagined seeing that deer and so the boy goes and he spends a couple weeks trying to find where this place was and the season ends so he has to wait a whole year and comes back to his grandfather and finally He figures out where this place is, and he tells his grandfather, okay, it's been a year. I found the place. Now can I have my gun so I can go hunt for deer? And the grandfather says, well, you're almost ready, but not quite. So I want you to take your drums, and I want you to go sit in the place where you found the deer, and I want you to sing your songs, and I want you to call the deer into you. So the boy goes... And he tries again, singing his songs. No deer comes. A whole year passes, comes back to his grandfather finally and says, Okay, I sang my songs and I had the deer come close. Now can I have the the gun so that I can go kill the deer? The grandfather says, Well, I want you to, now I want you to sing your songs. And I want you to wait till you can open your heart to the deer. Wait till it comes close enough that you can open your heart, love the deer, and have the deer open its heart to you. And so the boy goes and he does this after a couple of weeks and comes back to his grandfather and, and shares with him, Grandpa, I, I, I saw the deer and, and I, I felt my heart opening to it and, and I love the deer. And the grandpa says, okay. Well, it's time for you to take your gun, and I want you to go hunt the deer. And the boy says, well, I don't want to hunt the deer. I love the deer now. (laughs) And Grandpa says, well, your family needs the food. You need to go and, and, and hunt the deer. So the boy works up a, a fit of rage. It's the only way that he can kill the deer, and he jumps on the back of the deer and stabs it and brings it back to his grandfather, throws it on the porch and says, there, old man, are you satisfied? And the grandpa looks at him and says, when you can be as moved by stepping on a blade of grass as you are by killing that deer, that's when you'll be a man.